and uh, it's a tribute to the people who present so far that the day seems to have gone really, really quickly. So, uh, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> just to. Uh, <laughs> no pressure, Jeff, yeah. Uh, Talk fast. <laughs> um, just a couple of things about tonight because we'll, we'll obviously break up uh, at the end of this session. Um, for those people who are staying at the Ramada, uh, international colleagues and Ray and Mike. I'm international. Well, yeah, you are sort of, yeah. Okay, let's count you as an international. <laughs> My dad's happy. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be meeting up at about 7 o'clock in the, in the lobby for a drink and then sitting down for a meal. So if you are staying in the Ramada and you want to join us for that, then please do. Uh, I've got nothing else formal arranged. Um, but you have to pay for your own meal, all right? And your own drinks as well. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, so that's the plan for tonight, and then we start again at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, the same place. Uh, and we'll get through tomorrow. Jeff doesn't need any introduction from me, for most of you, um, if not all of you. And uh, I'm delighted that he's been able to join us today. Uh, and in view of the, uh, the current state of all British cricket, well, not all, the Irish, I guess, are quite happy with where they are at the moment. This might be a good time to, uh, to reboot some of their own cricket performance. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Douglas has commented on the eclectic nature of the programme. And a jolly good thing too, I think. So I'm going to add to that. There's a bit more eclecticity here. <laughs> uh, very focused in comparison with some of the magisterial sweeps we've had. This is a fairly focused look at really a couple of texts. Uh, one of the landmark events in the struggle for independence in the Anglophone West Indies came in 1960. This was the appointment of Frank Worrell as the first black captain of the West Indies cricket team. Ever since its formation as a combined islands team in the 1890s, the West Indies have been led by a white man, a consequence of the dominance in Caribbean cricket of the white planter and merchant classes. If it had never been so before, by the 1950s, with the team now predominantly a black one, the presence of a white captain was, was glaringly anomalous. The presence of a white, I'll put the right teeth in this hand again. The presence of a white captain was glaringly anomalous. The campaign to appoint a black man was orchestrated by C. L. R. James. As the editor of The Nation, the newspaper of the nationalist movement in Trinidad, the PNM, the People's National Movement, led by the scholar politician Eric Williams. Okay, historians of West Indies cricket have, of course, noted this important development to Frank Worrell, and underlined its political and racial significance. Indeed, many of them have taken the origins of the campaign further <coughs> back than the 1950s, seeing its beginnings in the early 1930s. And this is understandable in a sense. The 1930s was a time when organized economic and political protest on a large scale was emerging throughout the islands, in Trinidad and Barbados particularly. Surprisingly though, sport historians have had little to say about this aspect of Caribbean history. Michael Manley, um, Michael Manley observes a connection between cricket and politics but without really elaborating upon it, while other historians offer at best only a brief pause for comment. To 
Henry Beckles and Stoddart, uh, the Cummings paper, uh, Chris Searle, all mention um, cricket and politics, but don't really go into much detail about that. For them, what is important about the early 1930s is the figure of Leary Constantine. It's to him that they attribute the awakening of a race consciousness that gave rise to a sense of national identity and black liberation. Now this emphasis on Constantine seems to me to stem from a very particular source. The writer who has given most prominence to Constantine's political role in the early 1930s is C.L.R. James in his now famous, <coughs> indeed revered book, Beyond the Boundary, published in 1963. It's so well known among sport historians that any general comment from me about it would be superfluous. Save to note, and I think this is sometimes is it, often overlooked, that Beyond the Boundary was being written at a time in the late 1950s, early 1960s, when independence movements were carrying the day in the Caribbean islands. And James's text displays a concern to locate the origins of these movements. On Constantine, James is looking back over 30 years to remember a man with whom he had a close personal and political relationship at that time. And thus, in Beyond the Boundary, the problem of memory comes into the reckoning. It's not just a case of what is not forgotten, but of what and how things are remembered. What does James remember about Constantine? Well, firstly, as you might imagine, he remembers a cricketer, a great and a different cricketer, somebody quite unlike cricketers before him. Secondly, a man who broke free of race and class subordination by taking employment as a cricket professional in England in the Lancashire League for the club of Nelson. Nelson, for those of you who don't know it, is not very far away, in fact a mere four miles, from the place where Mr. Leonard lived, who was mentioned by Douglas just now, in Colm. In fact, Nelson and Cole at one time were part of the same constituency. By doing this, by going to Nelson, Constantine blazed a trail for <coughs> other Caribbean players to do the same in the 1930s. The most famous example of a person who followed um, Constantine to Lancashire was the great George Headley. So those are two things that, that uh, James remembers. But thirdly, I think, over and above these, these not inconsiderable sporting achievements of Constantine, James remembered a man who he said, was responsible for his own, that's to say James's, political awakening, and who, as a national sporting hero in the West Indies, was instrumental in the creation of a national consciousness. What struck James forcefully was Constantine's repeated refrain about black-white relationships. They are no better than we. They are no better than we. White people are no better than we black people. To unravel this, I think we should consider uh, what I might like to call the Nelson moment. Constantine had come to Nelson in 1929 to begin his work as a professional with the club. James came in 1932, he left the West Indies, Trinidad, uh, staying first in London, where, intending to make a mark as a novelist, he consorted with the Bloomsbury Circle. But in the spring of 1932, a 
for a short while in London, he moved to Nelson, where he stayed with the Constantines, that's to say Leary, his wife Norma, and their daughter, their young daughter Gloria. James <coughs> took with him to Nelson, amongst other things, three manuscripts. The draft of a novel, which came out subsequently as Minty Alley, the text of a book called The Life of Captain Cipriani, an account of the life of the then leading figure of political protest in, in Trinidad, Captain A. A. Cipriani. Or should that be Cipriani? Malcolm? I think it's Cipriani. Cipriani. I will uh, follow your rule. Uh, so two Minty Alley, the, the draft, uh, text of the life of Captain Cipriani, and also the draft of an autobiography of Constantine, which James had been preparing in Trinidad before he left. And that came out subsequently as Cricket and I. Interestingly, what uh, James did not bring along with him to England was Mrs. James, Joanita Young. She was left behind in Trinidad. And I think. Uh, I think CLR had um, designs in mind for his stay in England, other than writing. Um, Cipriani was actually published later in 1932 in Nelson by a local printing firm, the costs covered by Constantine. A shortened version of the text, named The Case for West Indian Self-Government, came out the following year, 1933, from a rather more prestigious printing publishing house, um, Leonard and Virginia Woolf's Hogarth Press. So the Bloomsbury networking had obviously paid off there. Cricket and I, under Constantine's name, appeared from the publishers Philip Allen in the same year, 1933. All of this happened before James's conversion to Marxism, which happened after and to an extent as a result of his stay in Nelson. In Beyond the Boundary, James lays much emphasis on long conversations with Leary, Constantine on politics and race, during which the they are no better than we refrain kept recurring. James says, up to that time, this is May 1932, I doubt if he and I had ever talked for five consecutive minutes on West Indian politics. Within five weeks, we'd unearthed the politician in each other. Within five months, we were su supplementing each other in a working partnership which had West Indian self-government as its goal. But from that account, it looks pretty straightforward. This meeting of minds, Constantine's inspiration, his politicization, radicalization, if you want to use a contemporary phrase that's often, I think, often misleadingly bandied about, um, leading to this, uh, this outburst of nationalist thinking. But some things are missing from this account. To start with, uh, James doesn't mention, in Beyond the Boundary, uh, three Nelson figures who, it later emerged, had been important in steering James towards a revolutionary politics. There were two local socialists, Harry and Elizabeth Spencer, and a Frederick Cartmel, a local man who had introduced James to the writings of Trotsky. As a Marxist, James was best known as a, a Trotskyist. Much later in the 1970s, James did acknowledge Cartmel, though he managed to, to get his name wrong. Something else James skates over is the radicalization, sorry, the radicalism of, of Nelson itself at this time, uh, especially its industrial militancy and its labor socialism. By the time he left Nelson in early 1933, James was moving towards the revolutionary left, very largely propelled in that direction 
by these other influences rather than by Constantine himself. And I'm indebted in making this point to the York University thesis at the bottom there by Christian Hogsberg on C.L.R. Jones' stay, crucial stay in Britain in the 1930s. So this issue of um, Constantine's politics and the conversion of James to, to Marxism becomes even less straightforward if we look at that third manuscript that James brought with him. This is Cricket and I, Constantine's autobiography. In it, Constantine acknowledges James. He said, I'd like here, I'd like here to give my best thanks to my West Indian friend, Mr. C.L.R. James, who has given me valuable assistance in the writing of this book. Valuable assistance in the writing of this book. James was rather more direct. In Beyond the Boundary, James says, I agreed to do the writing. And there is indeed, I think, an unmistakably Jamesian tone to the prose of Cricket and I, especially in the descriptions of cricketers and cricket matches. Read the two books alongside each other, so to speak, and you get the sense of that. In a number of ways, Cricket and I is a remarkable book. At a time when autobiographies of Schwarzman were rare, confined usually to the very famous, here is one about a player who, although well known, was scarcely one of the very greats at this time, scarcely one of the very greats, and moreover, he was black. The book records the activities of cricketers in the West Indies, for whom no previous written record had existed, apart from one or two sketchy references in books by the famous cricketer and cricket administrator Pelham Warner, Warner, who himself came from Trinidad. In this sense, Constantine puts Caribbean cricket on the map. But for readers seeking confirmation from this book of Constantine's early political radicalism, it must seem an unremarkable text. Cricket and I is not on the two passages apart, an overtly political text at all. There are, to be sure, some implications. It might be inferred from Constantine's discussion of the future of West Indian cricket, for example, that alongside the rivalries and fragmentation that, brought about, uh, that was brought about by the geographical spread of the islands, uh, that a stronger team mentality might be fostered. If the, captaincy, if the captaincy were to be vested in a man of colour. Uh, but that's, that's, a, that's an inference that the reader draws. It's not an explicitly made statement. And furthermore, in Constantine's uh, discussion of the controversial question of body line bowling, which was um, a controversy at its height at this time, 1933, Constantine might be interpreted as, as championing the black, man, the black man's right to bowl as dangerously as a white man. But such matters need teasing out. The light motif, they are no better than we, is muted if it's there at all in this text. There are good reasons why the theme couldn't be explicitly articulated. The circumstances surrounding the book's publication and preparation exercised a restraining influence. Gerald Howard, in his autobiography of Leary Constantine, <coughs> has argued, I think persuasively, that at this time, Constantine wanted, as Howard puts it, to live an uncomplicated life in Nelson. In contrast to Beckles, Howard plays down the political side of Constantine. And it's not that Nelson was an environment uncongenial to radical political views, quite the opposite, in fact. There was a strong politics of working class militancy there. Whether, though, it would have accommodated race issues is another matter. 
And I think Constantine felt it diplomatic to leave that untested area well alone. He was a newcomer, a public figure, nominally apolitical, and in any case had received some hostility on account of his colour on first arriving in the town. Howard says he had no illusions about the implications of being a coloured man. Equally important, if not perhaps more so, was the position of his employer, Nelson Cricket Club. As a leading institution in the town, the club served as a symbol of civic unity, standing apart from the town's political and industrial conflicts. Being drawn one way or another politically would jeopardise the club's relationship with its followers and, crucially, the financial support that they provided. And in another respect, the club as a group of individuals who made up its officials, its committee, and at least some of its membership, the club had its own political loyalties. In Nelson's case, there was a marked leaning towards the anti-Labour camp in local politics. Nelson Cricket Club, as a group of individuals, a group of leading individuals, was a kind of haven of uh, conservative liberal coalition against the strength of Labour in the town. The local Labour newspaper, the Nelson Gazette, certainly thought that this was the case. So if it's right, it's another reason why the club professional would feel constrained to keep to a neutral political stance. After the Second World War, when Constantine had retired from cricket, a different character emerged altogether. Freed from the confines of the cricket world, he opened up intellectually. In a series of cricket books, he expounded a critical view of the contemporary game, advocating what he called brighter cricket. In various broadcasts for the BBC, he was given latitude to speak freely on questions of race. And in 1954, he published his only non-cricket book, Colour Bar, an expression of moral outrage against racial discrimination throughout the world. And it was in the same year, 1954, that he returned to Trinidad, throwing in his lot with the People's National Movement, and became an avowedly political figure. So at this time, some 15 or 20 years later, that Constantine really acquired the heroic political stature attributed to him by C.L.R. James and others in the early 1930s. So I think we need to treat beyond the boundary with a certain amount of caution. With the evidence available to us, and I stress the evidence available to us, all that we can truly say about the early phase of Constantine's life is that it's very possible he held strong <coughs> views about racial discrimination and political nationalism, but these remained private, only finding their way into the public domain much 